Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. So after this dream, Jacob gets up, but then he meets his match in Laban. Uh, Remember this? He ends up meeting Laban. He agrees to work seven years to marry his oldest daughter, Rachel, the one he's in love with. Younger daughter. Oh, yeah, that's right. Younger daughter, Rachel. That's right. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. The years go by fast, but then on his wedding night, Laban plays a trick on him and puts the older daughter in his bed. And he wakes up and there's Leah. He thinks he went to bed with Rachel and he wakes up and there's Leah. And there's a whole lesson about that that we could talk about. I think the basic lesson is that when we look to find things in the world that will satisfy us, we always are disappointed. It's always Leah. We think it's Rachel, but but it's always Leah. He agrees to work another seven years so he can be married to both daughters. He loves Rachel more than Leah, which causes major problems. God blesses Jacob. During this time, God blesses him, though, materially and with lots of children. He has 11 boys and one girl named Dinah at this point. But things get difficult with Laban, and he wants to leave. And he tells Laban he wants to go back to his homeland But Laban keeps stalling and Jacob stays. And here we see that, you know, this dream that he had had an impact on his life because he stays until he hears from God in Genesis chapter 31. And I'm just going to quickly summarize what happens here. This is what I call act three. In act three, Jacob hears from God and sneaks away from Laban without his knowledge His wife steals some of the household goods from Laban, which is a a huge problem. Laban starts chases after him and catches up and confronts Jacob. But then they agree to separate on friendly terms. And Jacob prepares to meet Esau. And he's worried that Esau still wants to kill him. So he sends his family ahead. And once again, he finds himself alone. And that brings us to probably the most important story about Jacob. And it's uh, it's here in Genesis 32. Could somebody read Genesis 32, 22 to 32? Thanks, Tom. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabuk. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. With the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, And he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Okay, so this is the climactic moment in Jacob's life. This is the huge turning point, the breakthrough time, the place where Jacob finally finds out what life is all about finally figures out what his main problem is and he changes how his strategy his life strategy and it's interesting when he meets god he finds out that he's a wrestler up until this time if you think about it jacob is kind of trying to control his life he's trying to control god 
he thought the main problem in his life was Esau. All of his life, he thought what really messed him up was his brother Esau. But suddenly it's revealed to him that all his life he's really been wrestling with God. He's been trying to control God, and this is the problem. It's almost like God is saying to him in this wrestling match, the real problem is you're not trusting me. The real problem is you've been fighting with me for my will for your life, and you don't want to depend on my grace. You want to fight every bit of the way. By the way, at the end of this, the, the story, he's limping now for the rest of his life. And that limp is a reminder. It's actually a sign of grace, that limp, because he didn't get what he deserved. He got much less than what he deserved at this point. So if God had come down into this relationship in power, he could have won the battle, but he would have lost Jacob. And think about that with Jesus. If Jesus Christ would have come down in power and said, I'm going to wipe out all evil, he would have won the battle, but he would have lost all of us because we're part of the problem. But Jesus Christ came just like God when he wrestled Jacob. He came in weakness. Jesus came limiting himself. And so when, when Jacob is wrestling with the angel, which is God, he limits himself. You know, it says that Jacob prevailed. Jacob kind of won the wrestling match. Well, we know Jesus prevailed just like Jacob prevailed. And it, it looks like Jacob lost badly. Yet what does God say? He says, at this point, he's like, he changes his name. He says, your name is no longer Jacob. It's Israel. For you've wrestled with God and you've won. So Jacob wins by losing. And that's the perfect picture of what Jesus did for us. He wins by losing. Once again, Tim Keller says this, the reason Jacob could only get a touch of God's wrath was Jacob's greater son, the real messianic child, got it all. See, he only gave Jacob a touch of his wrath, but he put all of his wrath on his son, Jesus. So that moves us on to Act 5 in the story. In Genesis 35, we get a sense of how much Jacob's life has changed and how committed to God he is. Look at what he says here in verses 2 through 5. So Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, and you've never heard this kind of language out of Jacob's mouth, get rid of the foreign gods that you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let's go to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak of Shrechem. And then they set out and the terror of God fell on all the towns around them so that no one pursued them. My point here in what I call the fifth act is that you can see Jacob's changed life. You can see he's, he's more devoted to God than he's ever been. So real quickly, and I'm almost done. I got just two more, two or three more slides, and I'm going to summarize this so we can get to your comments and questions. Act six. This is in Genesis chapter 46, and I know I'm going beyond my scope of my study here. But we see now that Jacob is actively looking and listening to God for guidance. And God reassures him when um, that whole story of Joseph and he finds out Joseph is alive and then Joseph wants him to come down to Egypt. He waits to hear from God before he goes to Egypt to be with Joseph. That brings us to the final act, which is Act 7, I call it. See, the interesting thing about this story is God gives Jacob a new name. And what's the new name? Israel. And what does Israel mean? The struggles with God, triumphant in God. But what's interesting is from, this, from that point on, when God gave him a new name, why isn't it every time Jacob's mentioned, he's not mentioned by his new name? Why does God keep going back? And he goes back and forth. He sometimes calls him Israel, sometimes calls him Jacob. Well, you see this in the rest of the scriptures. Why does he do that? 
Well, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're in Christ. We have been given a new name, a new identity. He calls us righteous, holy, beloved. We have a new name, but it's not just a new name. It's a new identity. So you would expect from this point forward that every time you see Jacob's, his name would be Israel. But if you keep reading, you'll see that he's, ca he's called both. Well, why is that? Well, that's because change and transformation is complicated. Spiritual growth is complicated. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Spiritual transformation. So years, years later, after, G after Jacob died, we see something very interesting to note. And it's, and it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Moses asked God the same thing that Jacob asked God. So Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what is, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? I am who I am. That is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Okay. We've all heard that. I am who I am. But then he says this. God also says to Moses, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, the God of your fathers. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of Israel. No, he doesn't say the God of Israel. He says he's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Jacob. So he's not focusing on Jacob's good side. He's not focusing on his new identity. He's saying, I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the God of the part of you that you don't want anybody else to see. I'm not just the God of your success. I'm the God of your failures. I'm not just the God of your victories. I'm the God of your defeats. I'm the God of Jacob too. He's the God of the hypocrite, the, the skeptic, the hopeless. And boy, aren't you glad that it says he's the God of Jacob? Praise God. Because that means he's the God of Greg. So with that, I will take your comments and questions. Hey, Greg. Yes. Going over what you just said about the transformation of him, it's very interesting to note that when he's with Esau, back in those days, he goes, your God. He doesn't say my God, our God. He says your God. Then when he's wrestling, or I mean at the, uh, the stairway to heaven, He's funny because God and his sister say, I'm going to do this for you. And then he turns around and says, if you do this, I'll do this. Again, that growth process that you were just yeah. speaking of. And I think that's very interesting. Number two, one small correction. You keep saying the firstborn, but it's the firstborn male. That's true. Good correction. Yes. When they cut the deal, he saw Jacob... How come they didn't go to their father, Isaac, and tell them about the deal? Was it because it wasn't theirs, the blessing wasn't theirs to uh, make a deal about? Are you talking about the birth? The birthright. Well, they're different. You're saying they're different. Oh, you're, you're talking about the first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the birthright and the blessing are different. When he sold the birthright at the early instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, that's the thing. Is we read this with Western minds. When we read those stories, we think... Well, come on. It was a sham. He could easily take that back. He could just take the birthright back. I mean, you just go to your dad and say, hey, he tried to sell this to me. And, and the dad says, no, we're not. You know, it's like the, that's the way that's the way we would deal with it. But but in their minds, when Isaac and, and this is the blessing at the end, when he blesses Jacob, he can't take that back. He realizes it. Yeah. Go ahead, Pat. I want to follow up on this birthright thing because I used to always read that as a it was a material blessing. You you got the the rights of primogenitor, and when I re read it this year, I'm starting to think: is that also the? And maybe it's just a, a spiritual analog, but. You ended this with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not. Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. And so when the Bible records that Esau despised his birthright, 
is that a deeper spiritual significance that he despised the blessings that flow through Abraham and Isaac? And that's why it falls to Jacob. Hmm. Because other than that, Esau, at least in human terms, is clearly the better person. I yeah. mean, he, he's the victim of the deception. And when they meet in chapter 33, Jacob fares that which Esau had vowed. I'm going to murder you. But yet he comes out and he hugs for you to hug Jacob, just yeah. like the, the father hugged the prodigal son. And so you think, wow, Esau is clearly the better guy. Right. But the blessing doesn't flow through him. Yeah. I do think it's more than material for sure. I think that's a good insight. That's a good insight. Anybody else? Other questions? We got some over here. What is the Torah? Oh, the Torah. The Torah is just the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And, and that, that is like sort of the, the core of the Jewish faith. And so they take the, the Torah very seriously and they associate it with the number five. And so if you were to walk in a store and there were five oranges, they would think Torah. Like I said, those five stones, I think it's very interesting. I'd never thought of this before until I did some deeper research. When David is fighting Goliath, it's like he's taking the Torah with him. It's like he's bringing God with him which is really kind of a cool thing to think about. Yes. Well, you know what? You went to Exodus on here, which was great, but I'm going to go into Genesis. <laughs> We're going to start out with the promise that God made to send a Savior through Abraham's line, and nothing and no one would get in his way. God does what he says he'll do. And despite the rebellion and sin in our lives, and Abraham's descendants. His promises are true. Now, let's talk about name. Okay, we're saved. We say we're saved. What's our new identity? What's our new name? Christian. Do we exemplify that in every action, or are we growing toward more like Christ to live up to our name? You, I mean, you really nailed it here this morning, Greg, and I love the way you went through this whole thing. But it started out in Genesis 3.15, okay? Yeah. Culminates and culminates when he says, I am who I am, and my promises are true through your descendants. Yeah. Just to reiterate one of the things, it's so important for us as we're reading through Genesis to realize that God did not pick the best person. It's so different than the way we operate. We would always look at who is the best, per who's, who's going to be the best CEO for this company. We always pick the best, but God is showing us right in Genesis that he picks the undeserving. Go ahead. With that same point, what happens at the beginning of this story? Rebecca goes to God to say, what's going on in my belly? These two are fighting. He directly says the younger is going to, is going to be superior to the, the older. And later in the Bible, it directly says God hated Esau. Directly says that in Romans. And all you see through this whole Jacob's life and story is God is the one choosing God is the one running the show. And even though humans are doing the wrong thing, it doesn't change the fact that what God wants, it ends up happening. And that is, that's what you see that throughout Genesis. You're going to see that next week with Joseph. Yep. It, whatever God wants, it's going to happen. And it's a very good instructive. Jacob was not going after God. God was chasing Jacob. That is clear in my eyes in yes. the story. I love that. The biggest seeker in the Bible wasn't Nicodemus. It wasn't, you know, Zacchaeus. No, it was God. God is the biggest seeker in the Bible. Yeah, to follow up on that, throughout this whole chunk of scripture, it's like Jacob is searching for his identity. He lies to his father. Oh, I'm Esau. When he meets Laban, Laban says, oh, you are bone of my bone. Well, almost bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Doesn't quite complete the, the Genesis thing, but you're my bone. You're my flesh. You're a relative. And then it's only when he wrestles with God, then he admits, I'm Jacob. He actually uses his correct name after lying to everybody. And then God gives him the new name. Mm. And, and, you know, I mean, the number one question for every human being is the one Jesus poses. Who do you say I am? But if we can't answer that, we don't know who we are. Great thought. Great thought. I'm going to go on some heresy here. 
I wonder if Rebecca had told her son what God had told her when the boys were in her womb. And if she had prepared. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think they did in the tents? They were like. She talking. told him everything. And she was actually. I think, she, to I think she told Isaac. I think, I think she told Isaac and Isaac resisted and said, no, Esau is the blessed. And, and I, so Isaac was fighting God his whole life. And that's why he trembles at the end, because he realized I tried to fight God I, and it didn't work. OK, I by my thinking and I think like a Greek, I have to have facts, blah, blah, blah. I would disagree with you on the five stones that David went after Goliath, because the scripture says there were four other stones in case Goliath has four other brothers came along. So David picked up five sling stones yeah. to cover his butt in case he got yeah. Let me just tell you, I, I'm totally fine if I'm wrong, but I just want to tell you, like, there's layers of truth. Truth is unfolding. So, And what's cool about it, if you really get into it, is there's the obvious what, what he's writing, but then there's these other kind of non-obvious things that it is put in there. So, yes, I think you're right. He took five stones stones because he took five stones but then the five stones represented the brothers of goliath just in case he had to kill them but then the five stones could also represent the torah so what you see remember eight thousand words they only have eight thousand words so they stack them and so there's truth is like there's layers and if you really get into the rabbinic studies they're constantly trying to find these nuggets of and again i i'm i'm fine if i'm wrong about that so I, I think that there's a hyperlink for everybody in the room to the story of Jacob and Esau that exists in Hebrews chapter 12. And this is an application for all of us. So scripture says in Hebrews 12, verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that, it, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. So the application for all of us is that Esau chooses the temporal satisfaction of a meal over the eternal blessing of his birthright. And so we are cautioned to avoid doing the same in that those of us who are in Christ have a birthright, as you point out, in the stairway to heaven, right? That perfect sacrifice. So we, we ought not to choose that which satisfies us in a temporal manner, but instead fix our eyes on the eternal, which is Christ in us. And that's what Esau, in essence, rejected. I just wanted to say that I'm not so sure that Esau is necessarily the, the better man. I think it goes back to John chapter one. God knows what's in Jesus knows what's in someone's heart. And externally, he may have looked better and he may have done the right thing when he met with Jacob. But just exactly what he said in Hebrews and in some other areas and even in yeah. Malachi. Well, know. and he wanted to kill his brother. I mean, so that, that he wasn't that great of a guy. I, they were both flawed. I think the point, Larry, is if you had to pick one of those two guys to, to get the blessing, to be the messianic seed, the obvious one seems to be Esau. Outwardly. Yeah, outwardly. Okay, does somebody volunteer to close us in prayer? Thanks, Big Dan. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. You bless us each and every day. So many blessings. We can't even comprehend what they are. We thank you for that. But most of all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You watch over for each and every individual here and their families. You watch over as a week as we go about our daily chores and daily duties and work. May we serve you in the way that you feel comfortable with. May we be disciples in this world for you and for your son. We ask, thank you for you again for who you are. And we thank you for this men's Bible study and the teachings of the instructors. We ask this all in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode and remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.